This is going to be a question and answer session, only I'm going to only deal with one question. So it will serve as a sermon, I guess you would say, but it is a question offered and an answer given. And the question is, are piercings and tattoos wrong? You know, not many years ago in our society, one would not have experienced or expected a public encounter of many individuals with all kinds of odd body piercings or various kinds of assorted tattoos. The few tattoos that we saw were either related to military service or <laughs> maybe a biker gang or something like that. But maybe some of you are young enough where you can't remember when you just rarely saw something like that. And if you saw it, it might be up here on the arm or it might be down here on the arm. But I think that that does raise questions because, again, let's be reminded, as I've tried to do for a number of times, that when we go preach the gospel to those out in the world, we have to answer some of these questions because there may be folks that we contact and could very well be that have these body piercings and various kinds of tattoos. And let me say again, we can't expect them to understand the truth until they're taught the truth. We can't expect them to think like they ought to think in the light of the right divided Bible until they have been taught those things. As I think I've also said, if you were working with a church composed of members like there was in the Corinthian church, then the stronger members, the mature members, would have a great deal of bearing with folks to do. A lot of individual examples and teaching and training on a number of things, not just this particular topic, but just in all sorts of matters. There's a difference in working with a mature congregation, mature in Christ, and one full of a lot of converts. And I wonder sometimes if we're really ready to have a lot of converts who are fresh out of the world and they just really don't understand a lot of the more uh, in-depth matters of mature Christian character. They've got to be taught. I think we'd appreciate more why so much is said in the New Testament in view of the world and how it lived into which the church was going and preaching the gospel and redeeming people and seeing them converted when it comes to long-suffering and when it comes to uh, bearing with folks without compromising the truth at all. But we have these things today. And just about anywhere you go now, you'll encounter someone with, shall I say it this way, a plethora of tattoos and or body piercings, uh, some of them quite faddish. The question then arises in the mind of the faithful, conscientious Christian wanting to serve Christ as to what does God say about the matter? What does the Bible teach about it? Are these piercings all bad? Are any of them allowed? Is, is it bad judgment? Is it a good thing, an unwise thing? Well, what do the scriptures say? Well, let's back up a while and notice that under the old covenant, there was at least one type of body piercing that God approved. This was in the case where a master and slave had such a good relationship that the slave desired to give his entire life and the life of his family to his master. He didn't want his freedom. And under the law of Moses, slaves were supposed, supposed to be set free during the year of Jubilee, Leviticus chapter 25. However, the slave who didn't want to be set free was to have his ear pierced to signify his desire to remain forever along with his family with his master. Deuteronomy 
chapter 15 and verse 17. Now this tells me one thing, that those piercings like this were not immoral because in every age, patriarchal, mosaical, and Christian, immoral things have always been condemned. So this doesn't fall under a category of immorality. In other words, it's always been wrong to lie. It's always been wrong to murder, no matter what age in which God has dealt with man. It's always been wrong to steal. But he, he allowed this to happen. In fact, it was commanded of them that this was a state. Of course, you have to realize he also allowed slavery of this nature. Well, that shows you how things have changed. But nevertheless, he allowed it and he gave commandments concerning it. The Old Covenant wasn't, though, so generous when it came to tattoos. Now, I want to stop here and say you'll remember, too, that the Israelite men could not square off their beards. What you're going to find in most cases in these prohibitions for the Israelites is that it was to cut them off from the pagan nations round about and how they conducted their lives. They were physical Israel. They were God's chosen people. They were not to show in any way any compatibility with the pagan people round about. And in reading your Old Testament, one thing jumps out at you is that Israel always had a problem with not running off after these idols. So there were prohibitions built in the law that if they kept them, kept them separate, kept them apart. And didn't allow themselves to identify themselves with evil. Now, if I were to bring this over to the New Testament, I would do it under Revelation, or rather Romans chapter 14, verse 15. Where we see these things are written for time for our learning. Well, of course, we're not talking about squaring off a beard. But we're talking about the principle of how no child of God, a Christian of Christ, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, should be doing anything or presenting themselves in any way that identifies themselves with those of the world, those who are rebellious to God, those lost in sin. That ought to be kept in mind regarding a lot of the commandments under the law for fleshly Israel. In Leviticus 19 and verse 28, we find this. Ye shall not mark any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. Now, if you go back and study the scholars and all of that, then most of them believe that this prohibition was given, again, as I said, as a mark of separation of the Israelites from the nations round about them and all their adulterous activities. And they, I don't need to tell you because you've read it of all kinds of idols that existed in those days and all of the corruption that went along with it. So the prohibition against tattooing was, in those days, related to the idolatrous practices of the people around about it. Israel was to be separate. The fleshly Israel is a shadow of spiritual Israel, the church, the family of God today. And there's a lesson in that for us, and I've already stated it. Israel was to be holy to the Lord, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 7. Israel was to maintain their separation from heathen practices, Exodus 33 and verse 16, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 24. The Lord's church, remember we're saints as individuals, we are a holy nation then our lives should not be like the people who don't care about God, Christ, or the teaching of the New Testament, or serving Him faithfully. That's the way you apply those things. But each thing must be examined on its own merits in the light of the authority of Christ in the New Testament. So we're not under the exact same restrictions of the Old Covenant day, for we're not fleshly Israel. Yet there are principles that come down to us that will have application relative to our spiritual conduct and the examples, the pattern of life we set before others. So our pattern for living comes from the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and therefore from His last will and testament, the inspired teachings of the apostles and prophets. 
And while we have no direct prohibition of the apostles in the New Testament about piercings and about tattoos, we have some principles of gospel truth that would certainly regulate such conduct and if we're serious about being saints and all that saints mean and being pure from the world, we'll take those things into consideration. So let's examine just a few of these. First, there's the principle of modest behavior. Now I know we get very concerned about women showing too much and too tight clothes and that's all well and good. Not enough to think about that. But if you're limited to that, you don't understand the New Testament teaching on modesty. Modesty doesn't, first of all, just apply to the female, to the sisters. Modesty covers all of us. Modesty is a state of mind reflected in your actions. We have, we're to have a Christ-like attitude. We're to be thinking about how we present ourselves toward one another and everybody else. You know what Paul said to Timothy, which wasn't just for his information, but for him to teach the church in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 9, and also from Peter in 1 Peter 3 and verse 3. Which basically they are saying there, you don't dress in a way to draw attention to yourself. A flamboyant, a gaudy attire is not becoming of a woman professing godliness. It's not trying to draw attention to your body. The woman who is a Christian draws attention to herself by her attitude and by her conduct that is becoming a Christ-like spirit. And that really is what's being said when you see what modesty is in 1 Timothy 2.9. And when you look at all the multiple body piercings and elaborate tattoos and any other such kind of showy personal expressions then they would fall under the heading of immodesty. The Christian is not to call attention to self for the sole reading, uh, reason of promoting self. Look at me. When you look at some people, I'm talking about women here in particular, although that's changed rather rapidly in the world, and how they paint themselves up. You don't know really what some women look like. Till you can take all the paint off. And I don't think that's funny. <laughs> I consider it so. But it's true. Poor old groom. Uh, the Christian is not to call attention then. To himself or herself. To promote oneself physically. Or by what they wear. And so, so, so forth. And often these body piercings and tattoos. Are obtained just for that reason. Now think about it. If you've got a tattoo on your thigh, why is it there? If you've got a tattoo in the small of your back, just above your hips, why did you have it put there? If you've got a tattoo in other such like and more intimate places, why did you have it put there? So you could in private admire it? Of course not. The general disposition of heart is foreign to the New Testament teaching of a Christian. And I think we missed it on some of those things as to the why people wear and unwear and put on themselves what they do. I think it's rather interesting. Some of you who are roughly my age and even younger can remember the times that we had such teachers in grade school who would see you and, you know, if you had a, a ballpoint pen, you might draw something on the back of your hand. The teachers I had would have you washing that off and standing with your nose in the corner or something for a while. But some way or another, we haven't put away childish things. And now as adults, we've made them permanent markers. And I keep thinking, this is a bit humorous to me. Some of these folks at 18, 19, 20, 25 years old, and they got these things all over them. I won't be able to live to see it, but I'd like to see them at 75 and 80. I wonder what those things will look like then. 
Now that's humorous, but the thing of it is how they see themselves right now is not going to be the way they are if they live long enough later on. And that which may be so beautiful in their unregenerated eyes may not be so beautiful later on. So it shows also a disposition of heart that living for the moment and being involved in the flesh are the lust of the eyes. There's a principle of separation that all too often we don't see in the scriptures concerning Christians and their viewpoint of themselves, one in, uh, of, of their families, of the whole world and how they associate with them. The attitude of humility would preclude such in the life of Christians, Philippians 2 and verse 3. Now, I don't suppose there'd be a problem. Somebody wants to uh, have a tattoo on the inside of their gum with their Social Security number on it, so if they get burned up and there's that much left, they'll know who you are. I don't, there is a difference in that kind of thing. Um, but the principle of separation is often just simply overlooked. In other words, are you a saint? Now, if you're a Roman Catholic saint, you've been dead for 700,000 years, and then it'll make you a saint. That's not the biblical definition of a saint. A saint is simply a faithful child of God. Paul tells the church at Corinth, Wherefore, come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Come ye out from among them. This is written to the church, a part of the New Testament, having to do with Christian living. In other words, get out from living that way. Change your mind and perspective. Learn to think as Christ thinks, which means you have to know the Bible, that's where his mind is, and start thinking in that way. Thus, the Christian is not to engage in worldly activities as such. Now, you couldn't uh, just say that all body piercings are immodest. Should I ask for a showing of hands of the women that have their ears pierced? No, I won't. I won't even ask for show of the hand of the men that have their ears pierced. So I would have to say that not all of that is bad. But I would have to say that if you go and put the wrong thing on, just like you put the wrong clothing on, but especially something that's permanent, you can't go in the shower and wash off a tattoo. Not a real one. <laughs> that shows then that we're not thinking about the flag we're raising for the world to look at and say, that's what a Christian's like. That's how they operate. So we're not engaging in worldly activities as such as indicative of loving the world. 1 John 2, 15-17. James says that friendship with the world is enmity or hate with God, James 4 and verse 4. Now, understand we're applying this to piercings and tattoos. But I said earlier that if we reserve the modest apparel to just women and too tight clothing or too little of it, then we miss the whole idea of modesty. Modesty is a state of mind. So what I'm saying here regarding piercings and tattoos covers a whole lot more in the way we present ourselves than where we many times limit it to in the areas I mentioned. So we ought not to have anything to do with them when they're representing or exemplary of the people of this present world. There is the principle of sound speech that ought to be considered too. Titus 2 and verse 8, Paul said to Titus that the Christian speech ought to be irreproachable. Have you ever read some of those tattoos? You know, that is in words that convey a message, and it says to the people looking at them, here's what I think. I, I might stop here and say, what about T-shirts? Well, I'm not just opposed to a T-shirt. But I am opposed to some of the messages on those t-shirts. And yet we're not teaching in the homes where it ought to be taught first. What message are you sending by what's written on those t-shirts? And you know one reason those messages on those t-shirts? Because the people that want their advertising and their message out knows that's a good way to get it out. 
You're speaking for them when you wear that. And just think of what you see. Well, don't think too much about it. I start to say when you go to Walmarts. Because you can see about anything there that is ungodly and some of it plain ugly. Well, what about modesty? What about the Christian spirit? What about thinking? Well, that is something. What about just thinking about what we wear and what it says to everybody around us? And you might be surprised when you talk to our brethren, especially of the more liberal variety and some who just have not been doing their thinking with the truth of God as to the clothing they wear. Not just in the assemblies of the saints, but where they go. Out there is where we are to put forth the example of godliness to influence the world for good. You are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. You're the leavening for good out there. And when you're wearing something that has on it some message that certainly doesn't say what Christians want to say or advertises some business that is not conducive to godliness, then you're spreading that message. You're making that statement. You're advertising for a worldly outfit. Many tattoos represent things that the Christian repudiates. Um... Whoremongering, warmongering, fornication, all kinds of addiction, bondage, and just some foul language sometimes. Piercing may have also sexual connotations. And like the improper use of the tongue, which the Bible has a lot to say about that, the Christian who employs tattoos and piercings may be sending and sounding out mixed messages. And just some that are outright wrong. But I don't think people think about it. They just don't think about it. James 3.11 says, Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? So hypocrisy in any form is sinful. James 3 in verse 17. And I think there are people who just don't realize uh, they don't mean to be hypocrites. They just are sending a message that they don't even believe themselves as to the pattern of life one ought to live before the world. I think, I think it is interesting to see that, uh, that people, the most people, let me say it that way, the most people who have these tattoos are not really preaching the gospel on there. I'm not saying there aren't some that won't have scripture quotations or whatever, but even sometimes... It's where you locate things that make a difference. It's really what you think about it. I want you to think of this. Do you remember when the young maiden with a spirit of divination was being used by her masters to bring them money? And Paul came to town and she followed them around referring to Paul as the servants. These men are the servants of the Most High God. Question, did she tell the truth? Certainly she did. But Paul got vexed with that, and as the power of an apostle, and by a miracle, he cast it out and made, of course, the people mad who were using her to make money. But well, why did he cast it out? The, he was, she was declaring the truth. Think about it for a minute. She was declaring the truth. Was Paul a servant of the Most High God? Yes. Is that what she said? Yes. But consider who used her, and consider how it was being sounded out. Let's put it this way. Maybe you'll see the point. I wouldn't want my name and you wouldn't want your name as a man being used all the time by the women working in a house of ill repute. Even if they were saying, boy, oh, so-and-so is as honest a person as I've ever seen. Well, you may be. Is that true? But look who's saying it. And that's a good point as to why Paul cast that spirit of divination out. Yes, she was saying the truth. These men were the servants of the Most High God. But look where it's coming from. You know, does that take up space or does it teach us a lesson? Is it just taking up space or does it teach us a lesson? You have to know why Paul did what he did. It certainly wasn't because she wasn't stating the truth, so why did he do it? It's 
according to who was saying it, where it was coming from. And that's what we must realize as to the pattern of life we set before others as to what we say and what we wear and so forth. That's why I say that if you really understood the biblical teaching on modesty, then you'd see in modesty covers a lot of areas that we normally don't think of. There is the principle of purpose, where we purpose to do something. We're to purpose in our heart concerning our giving on the first day of the week. We're to plan it out. We're to give as we've been prospered cheerfully without grudging. And uh, that's done in the mind to plan on things. In everything we do as Christians, our purposes must be pure and holy. All must be done to God's glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So when that uh, tattoo is being put on, you're doing that to God's glory? That's something to think about. And the message that's coming off that t-shirt, is it to God's glory? And so on. Those who obtain piercings and tattoos must ask themselves what their motives are for so desiring such. Motives make a great deal of difference. Does one desire to rebel against parents? If they do, it's a sinful motive. But if you've got it tattooed on there as to how you feel about your parents or government or whatever else, and it's rebellion, then something's wrong. Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 1. Does one desire to show one's Sexual attitude, maybe sexual promiscuity. Well, they do all the time. You have to look the other way with some of the things that are on these T-shirts and that are written in indelible ink of some kind or another with a needle on the people. What is the motive? I suggest it couldn't be anything but a sexual motive and therefore a sinful motive. First Thessalonians 4, 3 through 7, as I've just described those things. Does one desire to use their body art to support anarchy or rebellion? That not be seen in the life of a Christian. And I think Jude deals with that in Jude verses 8 through 10. You see, brethren, sometimes let's just take the word modesty. We have limited the definition of it to fit just certain things. But it's more broad than that. It fits a lot of things. And since we're the salt of the earth, we're the leavening for good in the world, I have to think about what I'm wearing, what's said on that clothing, and what I say on my skin, and whatever kind of body piercings there would be. So we ask the question again, are they bad? That is, body piercings bad? Well, while there may not be anything inherently sinful in having one's body pierced, I, I think I've benefited from uh, vaccinations and shots, and that was piercing the body. So I don't mean anything like that. Well, it is piercing the body, so you cannot just wave it all off. I guess somebody, as I said, could have something tattooed on them somewhere, but to what purpose? What motive? Why would you do it? Why do we ride on ourselves? That's what I would say. Why haven't we outgrown it? So there's so many things that one need take into consideration to avoid evil. And we need to make sure that we avoid the very appearance of evil. And that doesn't mean when something looks like evil, you avoid it. It means what is evil, when you see it coming, you avoid it. I remember one time, maybe illustrate this, when I was raised just a little bit boy, we still had open range in Arkansas. And uh, so cows and stuff still ran loose. And if you hit one of them, you paid the farmer for it. And up on the hill, a family by the name of the Garmanies, and one of them was in my class at school, had a big farm. And they had no bull. As we would say in those days, he was a bobtail brimmer bull. Anybody know what a Brimmer bull is? Well, let's be very up-to-date and educated and say a Brahmin. Well, he, people kept their milk cows in those days. <laughs> well, he would come patrolling the neighborhood, and he was ready to butt and fight anything. And, you know, you could be out in the front yard and look up the hill and tell when he rounded the corner because you'd see all the mamas running out and grabbing kids out of the front yard and taking them in the house, and all the dogs be barking. You avoided that old Brimmer bull with a bobtail. And as soon as you saw him, you avoided him. 
Now, what is evil as the Bible defines evil? When you see evil, then you run from it. You avoid it. You get away from it. You don't tamper with it. You don't play with it. And that's just a good rule of thumb about what is modest and what is not. You can't just come out and say, all body piercings are wrong. If you did, all you ladies with pierced ears are bad trouble. And you can't say that all tattooing is wrong because you may baptize some of these fellows someday and they may be truly converted. Now what are they going to do about those tattoos? Well, they can go down and have them, whatever they do to them, lasered off. Yeah, won't you give them the money to do that? Point is, don't get yourself in that mess. That's called wisdom. <laughs> and the other thing is, if we do convert people like that, you've got to work with them and leave them alone. The people I've seen that have truly been converted, that's had tattoos, you'll never see them after they're converted because they try to make sure they're covered up. Now, why? Why? What happens in their minds that say what we once liked and had put on because we wanted everybody to see it, now we've been converted to Christ through the gospel, we've learned something, and we don't want to advertise that any longer. Why? So we need to take those things and learn to apply them because if you just say a tattoo is absolutely wrong, then a person being converted to Christ and repented. Now the nature of what's said on that tattoo might make a big little difference to how you deal with it after you are baptized in Christ. As of the message sent. But you, well, I hope you see this means discretion in the light of the truth and long suffering must be involved. But for us it means also this. If you haven't done it, don't. That's just pretty good guidance. There'll be a whole lot of children in this world have a lot more happiness once they grow out of their late teens and 20s if they had just heard their mom and daddy saying, don't do that. And listen to them. Mom and daddies were put here, yes, to say it's okay when it is, and they're supposed to know when it is. But they're also said to put here and say, don't do that. That's why their mama and daddies, according to the teaching of the scriptures, they're supposed to know more than the kids. They're supposed to be raising the kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They're supposed to be training them so that they can be what they ought to be. So you see how thinking on the part of all of us must be done and be able to follow. Let me just read this. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Romans 14, 19. Now you see how in every age things can come up, but the truth there is how you apply it to these different things that come up. Let me end by simply saying, when I read that, when I was in college, you didn't see all of this, even after I got out of college. Even after I was married, you didn't see all of this plethora of tattooing, but it was still the truth applied to my day and time as to what was then not good. So now this has come up, but the truth was already there, therefore I apply it to what's going on now. That's what makes the Bible such a wonderful book, is that it doesn't have to say, thou shalt not wear tattoos, or it doesn't have to say, it is immodest to do thus and so. It gives you the principles whereby, and it assumes your dedication is to God above everything else, that you want to set a godly attitude in your life before everybody. And so the principles of truth are there. And we always want to be sure we let that influence us. So that's the way that I would apply this when it comes to the matter of what is modest, what is immodest, what about the... Tattoos, what about the piercings, and so on. If you're thinking like the New Testament says you ought to, because remember, Christian means of Christ, then that'll answer a lot of questions, not just on tattoos and piercings, but on T-shirts and on clothes and everything else that sets you apart from the world and does not allow you to identify with the world. Now, to end this up, it comes down to this. 
If you're a child in the home, whether you understand what I said today or not, and your mom and daddy says, no, you're not going to have one, then you better not get one. Mom and daddy said no, and you're under their jurisdiction, and you will sin if you disobey them. It's just that simple. If you're not a Christian this afternoon, we urge you to believe that Christ is the Son of God, and all the New Testament says believe that He is. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. With the resolve, I'll live faithful. I'll draw as close to Christ as I can and my knowledge of the truth, and I will set a godly viewpoint toward the world so the world can see Christ living in me. If you've erred as a child of God in any of these areas, then we beg of you to seriously consider it. If it's a private sin, no, no, you and God take care of it. Privacy and your repentance and confession and prayer. But if it's public and it's caused people to think of the church in a way because of the way you've lived that is contrary to the teaching of the Bible, then you need to repent of that. Come confess again and pray God for forgiveness. This invitation song is now sung to encourage you to obey the truth as you need while we stand and sing.